Thank you, Mike, so much. And there's more coming from him, okay? Isn't that cool? Aha, I'll get there in a minute. All right. <clears throat> when I was a young boy, I thought that I was one-eighth Cherokee Indian, and the rest of me was Scotch-Irish. And I really loved being Irish. And then one day my daddy told me, or my granddaddy actually, when I was inquiring about our background and that kind of thing, said, do you know what Scotch-Irish is? And I said, uh, means you're from Scotland and Ireland. He said, no. It means that your ancestors were crooks or debtors. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yes. Scott Irish was a term for the people who came to the Carolinas and Georgia before vetting and came there and just came and lived there. And he said, and that's where you are from. So he said, you're really, because they were brought from Britain, you're really from Britain. You're really English. And I don't know what I am, but anyway, it's not really important. But it kind of dashed my hopes, okay, because I love Irish humor. I love Irish music. And uh, so I, th I thought I might just share with you <laughs> a little bit of Irish one-liners, okay? And, and then after that, some two-liners and some three-liners. And it uh, kind of goes like this. Uh, what do you get when you cross Queens and Ivy with a four-leaf clover? A rash of good luck. <laughs> You're going to lose your job. And anyway, and, <laughs> and what do you call an Irishman who knows how to control his wife? A bachelor. <laughs> O'Reilly is walking through a graveyard when he comes across his headstone with the inscription, Here lies a politician and an honest man. Faith now, exclaims O'Reilly. I wonder how they got to two men in one grave. <laughs> I love this Irish blessing. May those who love you love us. For those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so we will know them by their limping. <laughs> it was St. Patrick's Day and an armed hooded robber burst into a bank of Ireland and forces the tellers to load a sack full of cash. On his way out the door with the loot, one brave Irish customer grabs the hood and pulls it off, revealing the robber's face. The robber shoots the guy without hesitation. He then looks around the bank to see if anyone else had seen him. One of the tellers is looking straight at him, and the robber walks over and calmly shoots him also. Everyone by now is very scared and lying down on the floor. Did anyone else see my face? Screams the robber. There's a few moments of silence when one elderly Irish gent, looking down, tentatively raises a hand and says, I think me wife may have caught a glimpse. <laughs> it's okay. We'll get, we'll get even in a second. Just a second, okay? Walking into a bar. Oh, that sounds Jewish, doesn't it? No. <laughs> Walking into a bar, Shamus says to O'Hare, the bartender, pour me a stiff one. Just had another fight with the little woman. Oh, but jabbers, said O'Hare. And how did this one end? Ha, when it was over, Shamus replied, she came to me on her hands and knees. Really, cried O'Hare. Now, that's a switch. What did she say? She said, come out from under the bed, Shamus, you little chicken. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. All right. You know how long that took me <laughs> to learn a bad Irish accent. Okay, so what I want to talk about this morning is this story of what we can we learn from uh, Miwan Sakat, close. And um, some of you may know who he is and some may not. But he was born in 387 in Roman Britain. The, the Roman 
were in char- were, uh, had conquered Britain and were still around. Well, not quite around, because what happened was is that there was an uprising in Rome, and so all the Roman soldiers from Britain went back to Rome. And what happened then is that it left the country vulnerable to raiders, the Druze who came out of Ireland. And when they came out of Ireland, they would come over and they would capture young boys and make them slaves. And so when he was 16 years old, Mewen got captured and taken to Ireland to be a slave. He was a shepherd. And he was treated pretty roughly. But he had one friend who taught him how to be a shepherd. His name was Cree. And what Cree would do is share with him that he also needed to become a Christian. Because you see, Mewen had been raised in a Christian home. He had been raised with his father as a member of the presbytery. He'd been raised as his grandfather as a minister. And so he chose not to listen to them. And some of us do that too. We don't listen to our parents all the time. And decided that there was no God at all. And then when he was captured and put into slavery, he was convinced there was no God at all. But Cree talked to him and worked with him and told him just to pray to find out if he had any connection with God at all. And so he prayed. He said, I prayed 100 times every day because I didn't have anything else to do. And then I prayed 100 times at night because I was scared. And he prayed and he prayed. Well, he was in his fifth year when he had one of four dreams. His first dream was that he would be freed within six months and he would go back to Britain. And the dream was very vivid to him. And he said, so get ready, get ready. And about a month later, he had another dream. And he said, leave tonight and go to the shore of Ireland and catch a ship which is waiting there for you to take you back home. And so he went, and he walked 200 miles, the story goes, back to the shore of Ireland. And there was a ship there. And he went up to the people on the ship and said, I, I, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here for me. I want you to take me home. And they said, take you where? He said, home. He said, he said no, we're not taking you home. No way. So he got off the ship and he went down and he started to pray and ask God, what's wrong? I don't understand. About that time, one of the people on the ship, one of the seamen came up and said, come on, we're going to take you aboard. They took him aboard. Once he was aboard and they set off to sea, they told him he was now a slave again. So he got his third dream. His third dream was that he would be only a slave for two months, for 60 days but that he would be a slave for 60 days. And so while he was there, he shared his good news, as he called it, about God and, and how they needed to repent. And the, sail, the, the sailors just laughed at him. But what happened was there was a storm at sea, and all the food got damaged. And so they set ashore. And when they set ashore, they all were starving to death and They said to uh, Miwan, why why don't you pray for us and pray for food? This this God you're talking about ought to bring us food. And he said, no, pray for yourselves. You do the praying and ask God to bring you food. Now, when you're starving to death, you'll do just about anything. So they got down on their knees, the story goes, and they started to pray. And out of the woods ran 30 pigs that they roasted for dinner. And so then on the 60th day, they said to him, you are free, as they set ashore, as set ashore in Britain. He went back to his home, was reunited, decided that he wanted to become a Catholic priest, went through the schooling, did all the things he needed to do, was in a monastery, and he got his fourth dream. And the dream was that a fellow by the name of Victorious, an interesting name, <clears throat> was coming to him and had in two big baskets notes from the people of Ireland saying, please come help us. Please come help us. And so he told the bishop and the people in charge, I need to go back. And they said, no, you'll get killed. His parents said, you are crazy. People said to him, you ought to hate those people. They took away your childhood. You ought to give up on them. Forget it. Stay here where it's safe. And he continued to work at it for 20 years. At the end of 20 years, the church said to him, we're wrong. You have been called to go to Ireland. And he went to Ireland. 
While he was there, he became known as, as you already know, St. Patrick. He built 700 churches in Ireland in the 29 years he was there. They give him credit for converting 120,000 people to Christianity. And Druism, as it was known then, pretty much banished from the island. So he was a great man, did a great job, and they had a St. Patrick's Day celebration for him, but it wasn't until recent history that they made it a national law just about everywhere where they've had parades. The first parade for St. Patrick was in New York City, not Ireland. And uh, so this man made an impact on the world. But there were a couple myths about him. One of the myths was that he drew, he was so powerful that he drove all of the snakes in Ireland out of Ireland. Now, we know that's a myth because there are no snakes and never have been snakes in Ireland. What some priests that were metaphysically interpreting what happened, okay, was that what they were saying is that people came to Christ and he brought people to Christ and as he brought Christianity into Ireland that he drove out the pagans of the Druze. And those were the snakes, supposedly. Now, you and I know there are no snakes. Not in people. Not whatsoever. We're all God's creation. But that's what they thought then. Now, the second myth about him is that he used a shamrock to explain the Trinity. So he was talking to a crowd one day, supposedly. He picked up a shamrock, or a three-leaf clover, as you and I would know, and he pointed to each leaf and he explained the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he said, here's the stem that brings them all together as one. And the people started to understand it and started to become Catholics because of it. Well, that never really happened. That is a myth, supposedly. But you know, I think there was. I think there was a shamrock, if you would, in his life. The first shamrock for him, or not shamrock, but the first leaf of the shamrock for him, was that if you look at his life, he trusted God. He really did. At a young age, he learned to trust God. He learned to listen to God as the second part of that shamrock. And as he listened to God, and we all talk to with God or as God in different ways. And he, like Charles Fillmore, received his messages in dreams. But he didn't ignore them. He didn't say, oh, that's a crazy dream. Dreams gave him hope. It gave him the ability to have persistence. It gave him the ability to understand his life and to understand how God was moving in and through his life. And then the last thing was that he was committed to following God. Following God. Following what was inside of him. Speaking to him. Guiding and directing him. You and I would call that spirit. You and I would call that the I am. You and I would call that the Christ within. It doesn't make any difference what we call it. You know, Emily Cady in her last chapter of her book in Lessons in Truth says that we're all one. And however anybody with desire and with focus worships God and seeks God, they will find God. No matter their faith, no matter their religion, no matter what, if they... Focus on finding God, they will find God. And then our job is to follow God, and our job is to understand that each and every person is following their path to God, and we can honor that, and it's okay. And so we have a shamrock, if you would, in unity. Ed Rorty brought this back from Key West a number of years ago and shared it with Vicki. The first part of the shamrock is five, the number five. It says, you know, when you get up in the morning, you've heard Vicki say this, I want you to say five things that make you feel good, that make you know you're blessed in the morning. How many people do that? How many have done it? Yeah, see? And, and I do it. She got me doing it. I say, thank God the dog's off the bed. That's one of my favorite ones now. Anyway, um, but you say five things. And, you know, it kind of sets the tone for the day. It sets your intention for the day. 
It says how you're going to show up in the day. How are you going to treat other people in the day? If you feel good, if you feel blessed, if you feel abundant, that is what you're going to share with others, no matter what's going on around them or around you. It's not about how much money you have in the bank. It's not about how many friends you have. It's not about how good everything in your life is. It's all about feeling blessings for what you do have and knowing that you are living in the overflow, an abundant universe. Five things each morning. I would suggest I've added five things at night that you do the same. And so we look at those things. So that's one part of that shamrock, that three-leaf cover. The second part is listen. I'm sorry, it's not that. It's two. Two. <clears throat> I'm a minister. So I get the opportunity pretty regularly to share what we teach here and to share it with people. I mean, they come here to the church and ask. They send me an email and ask. They call me and ask. And you expect me to do that. One of the things that I want to share with you is St. Patrick didn't bring 120,000 people to the Catholic Church to his faith by not talking about it. We don't talk about this much in unity, I know, because evangelism, as it grew in the last 50 or 60 years, has beat people over the head with it. We also honor that there are many paths to God. But, you know, some people are looking for a path to God. Some people are seeking a path to God, and they don't know where to go, especially if it doesn't align with what they were taught as children. And you and I have an opportunity to share with two people once a week in casual conversation with, when, when we have the opportunity, and it will appear, to tell people about how we are growing spiritually. How God is blessing us in our lives. We don't have to talk about spirit. We don't have to talk about anything except we are being blessed in our lives. It's the universe is blessing us, brings answers to us, creates wisdom opportunities for us. And when we step into that, we will have an influence on people. I know because it happened to me as I came into unity. There was a change in the way I was seeing the world, and other people noticed it and asked me about it. The transformation was working. And so I shared it with folks. Not any of those ever came to unity. But that's okay. Because they knew I was honoring them and their faith as I talked about it. Take this opportunity two times every week to find somebody who's looking for spiritual growth or who just wants to know more about what you believe or willing to discuss it. You'll find them. And you don't have to convert them. That's not the opportunity. And then the third thing, and this is the toughest one, bring somebody, bring somebody to a unity service, a unity class, a unity get-together, whatever it happens to be, so they can feel the energy here and they can feel the love. It won't scare them. It will make them feel good. It won't run them away. They may not continue to come. But it won't run them away. What they'll see is this is not what I'm looking for. And that's okay too. But open that opportunity up to people. We get 90% of the people who visit here through our website today. But did you know the statistic is still 70% of the people who join a church join because a friend invited them to church? Many of you have invited friends. I want you to continue to do that. I'm asking you to do that. Because we have a powerful, powerful message in that God is unconditional love. God loves you just the way you are. God sees the perfection in you. You're totally worthy of everything that God offers. You are an heir, a child of God. So I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying you need to. I don't want to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying think about it. Pray about it. And I think as you pray about it, like those pigs that came out of the forest, you'll have some people show up in your life who are looking, who want to be fed. St. Patrick wrote this poem. Arise today through the strength of heaven. 
light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I rise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me, afar and anear, alone or even in a multitude. I affirm the Christ, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks to me, Christ in the eye of that one who sees me and the one I see, Christ in the ear that hears me. I rise today through the mighty strength of the Lord of creation. This he did not write, but I will finish with this thought. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be ever at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.